Okay, hello everybody, welcome back. So here we're going to look at my round two game against Joshua Ruiz, Grandmaster. Um, and yeah, actually both of the games that I lost, because I only lost two of them, both were as black to GMs, and this was one of them. And uh, actually only one of those games I would say was the result of the opening. So that's pretty much my main goal of this tournament, is to just have good opening preparation. Um, and yeah, I would say from that perspective it's largely successful. Um, so okay, let's see what happens. Um, so Joshua is a pretty reliable E4 player. I've never played him before, but he has you know almost every game in the database that he's played recently has been the E4, so it's unexpected. And okay, of course, I play my current con. This is pretty much my main response to uh, E4 right now. Um, although you know I have played E5, played C5, and played E6. Um, so okay, anyway, C6 is what I play up. And yeah, I saw for the game that he has played a lot of this advanced variation. I think the advanced variation pretty much like, you know, when GMs play it, uh, it's really the main way for what you're trying to get an advantage. Um, and this H4 move has been pretty trendy lately with the idea to play okay, like also C4. So I mean, there's a lot of theory here too that uh, I would have been prepared for uh, if he went into it. But instead he got we can went for uh, something different, like my C3 and my death ring. So this is just kind of a modest, you know, development system. Like it's not really doing anything too middle with the D block, it's just leaving the ball in D2. I might want to go to D3, maybe and feel faint out of this bishop. Um, play kind of in King's Indian style. But yeah, White's just kind of developing the knights, you know, saying I'm gonna control the center, and if you play mid f6, then I'll play e5 and kick you away. Um, so okay, it's a very reasonable approach and there's a lot of ways that look black can play this. Um, the main move is bishop g4, which is you know perfectly reasonable. Just getting this bishop out, and I'm going to e6, so it won't be stuck here on c8. Uh, but yeah, the way that I like to play against this is I take an e4, and I play an f6. So I'm basically going for this structure. If it wants to take, then I'll take back with e pawn. And this is actually a well-known structure. Um, I think this is like the Victor Korchner variation or something. Um, but but this, this kind of structure, the double F pawns like this, and then like having four versus three on the king side, this is known as the Korchner structure, as far as I know. Uh, and this actually would be a very nice version for black, where white pretty much has no advantage already, because this knight on f3 is just misplaced. Um, it doesn't really have any good scores to go to forward, and I mean, black is going to be just fine with the bishop e6 castle, and black's compensation for this pawn structure, so white in the long run has, you know, if we get to a king and pawn endgame, four versus three is going to be winning, but black just has pretty easy development with these. Bishop g4, this is oftentimes a big annoyance, um, which is why the knight is not really good on f3, and then bishop c5, you know, or bishop g6, we castle, we work on e8, and just develop the pieces, and it's pretty complicated. So, that's not white's idea behind uh, the system. He doesn't want to take on f6, so instead he plays queen e2, which is the new move. And this looks kind of strange, but okay, White is hoping for, okay, if you take, I'm going to take with a queen, and that will unclog my development. Um, because, yeah, on the surface, queen e2 is a pretty strange move. It blocks the bishop, um, but it's kind of figured out to be uh, one of the more challenging ways for it to play as uh, after an six. And obviously, there is the little trap. Uh, black plays the natural move, knight bd7, so it would be a horrible blunder, because through six moves, you get checkmated. So, yeah, you wouldn't want to do that. Okay, so I decided to fall for that. I did touch my knight though, and the only, you're not going to go to d7, you can go to a6. This is actually a very rare move. Um, and basically, you know, the idea is I'm not going to, I'm not going to release the tension here. And if you ever do take, I don't mind taking g pawn. And it, it's, it's, it, we get some pretty strange, you know, imbalanced positions very quickly. Um, which, okay, if, if you're trying to play kind of, you know, interesting games in black, on the Karakam, and you don't want just kind of some drive position. Like, you know, that's something could happen if black plays bishop g4, and then okay, you know, after like h3, bishop takes f3, queen takes f3, okay. And we just, we'll, we'll get some kind of, you know, drive position. I mean, it's playable for black, it's playable for white. Um, and it's going to be some kind of maneuvering struggle. Uh, over here, this is a little bit more combative, so this is more ambitious to play for black. Um, so, now there is not a lot of theory here, um, so I'm not really going to go into like, too many details about um, like you know, all of the 
different things that can happen. Um, so basically, white could, white can't take on f6, he doesn't have to. Instead, he played d4, so he's also just kind of leaving the tension. This is something that you'll notice a lot of stronger players do, is when there's any kind of tension in the position, they don't want to release it, un unless they really have to. So, like here, you know, there's no rush to take this thing. This thing's not going anywhere, and black is not going to waste time moving that into the center. It's just going to be kicked away. And black also doesn't want to take this, because it's just going to help the fight develop. If he gets out, the bishop gets out, and white is fine. Um, so, okay, the whole point now is black again wants to get white to release the tension. So we play queen d5, this is the point. So, you know, once again, I'm not going to take any points, but I want white to make this exchange. And we'll get the same structure. So, this is what happens. So, you could also play knight c3, this is more playable. Um, it's also playable. And then, you know, the queen wants to go you know, somewhere, say to a5, and this kind of resembles some strange Scandinavian, where the knight is on a6, it gives black some extra, like, tactical opportunities, like, already if she knight b4 and bishop f5 is a little bit tricky for it to handle. And white has also strangely put the queen on e2, where it just blocks his bishop, and, you know, white's gonna have to waste some time uh, to fix his development there. So, and already at this point, like, the main appeal for this structure, uh, like, at the level that, you know, playing it against a GM. I, you know, in the database, I don't think you could find a single game where, like, anybody has had this position over the board game, at, at least at the GM level. So, we're basically, we're, we're pretty much both on familiar territory. Um, I'm a little bit more familiar because this is kind of my pet line that I've studied. Um, but yeah, I don't know if he was still familiar with the position or you know, what the right plan was. Um, the time usage actually was interesting. So he came to, he came to the board 10 minutes late and I played my opening moves fairly quickly, and then when I played knight a6, he actually thought for, um, he thought for 13 minutes, actually. So, like back in this position, knight a6, queen 2, knight a6, he thought for 13 minutes, and he came up to b4. So, yeah, I don't know if he was still in work after that, but, anyway, we got this position, c4 is very reasonable, and now the whole idea is the queen goes to a chop. And, yeah, I would say, this way of playing for black is, it's strategically very risky, um, the reason I say that is if white just is able to finish development and you know nothing bad happens to him, you can just get the queen out of the way, play bishop e2, bishop b2, you know, castle, or castle this way, you can all the pieces out of it. And black strategically is much, much worse because white is having more space in the center. Black just has these you know structural weaknesses with not really much to show for it. Um, the knight on a6 is also, you know, can be prone to becoming a bad piece if white plays a3 and it doesn't have a great way of getting to, you know, a sensible square. But, you know, in return for that, black has some kind of dynamic activity, right? So, like, we have an open file for rooks, this bishop has an open diagonal, but, um, not that one, but this bishop has an open diagonal that it wouldn't have if the pawn was still in g7, so there's some extra open lines here that we could use. And, okay, and this pawn in f6, it controls the center a little bit more, maybe black would play for e5 break, and this should be, like, one of the main ideas for black in the system, uh, is to kind of just combine this play in the g file, you know, bring the bishop out to h6, and this other bishop to f5, h4, and then play e5 at the right moment. Um, and, you know, if pretty much the game, I think, will be decided in the next 5 to 10 moves, uh, who is going to be better, who's going to be pressing. Like, if white can complete development and consolidate and have nothing bad to happen to them, then white would be strategically much better than, you know, almost winning. But, I mean, black can you know, play for tricks and get enough peace activity to compensate for the structural weaknesses. Then the game will be, you know, at best unclear, maybe black will be better. So, yeah, he played he played his next move here pretty quickly, so I'm sure he was anticipating all of this um, when I played knight 6 He played queen e3. And yeah, here actually I was, uh, I didn't know my preparation for this was not totally, uh, I would say, up to snuff. Uh, because yeah, I, I, I wasn't actually quite familiar with, you know, the specifics of how black should play this position. I was just kind of playing it on site. Um, which, okay, I mean, against the GM, I think it's a pretty risky thing to do. Um, and the problem with is it's not really a position where you can play natural moves with black. Uh, you have to be, like, very accurate when you can do. Um, so anyway, so I played with G8. So this is natural enough. Um, and white just plays bishop e2. Uh, he thought for... Okay, he does on this move also. And it, I, we'll, we'll see what happened in the game uh, after I made a couple more natural moves. This is really my mistake here. Um, so I played bishop f5. So I'm thinking, get the bishop onto this active diagonal. And 
I, I didn't really know yeah, if bishop g4 is better. Uh, I considered also like bishop g4 and playing e5 very quickly, but I, you know, I haven't actually looked at this specific position in, in that much depth to be able to know for sure if that was the right play or not this early. Um, so, because e5 is generally something Klein wants to do, but you know, here with the king's on e8, it does feel a little bit too early. But okay, so we're g8. Um, bishop g2, bishop f5. And he just cast the queen side here. So I think this is also, you know, one of the reasons why playing as a strong player here, uh, you know, I think a, a lot of, a lot of people would just immediately discount castle and queen side because, like, it, it looks very risky to have the bishop, you know, staring at your king here. And actually already, you know, black can play moves like maybe four. I mean, it's, this is the first move that came to mind here. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people just feel uncomfortable and say, no, you know, I don't, I don't even want to let him play maybe four. This is like, you know, no, I can't take because, Queen. I mean, you know, what's going on here? Starting to checkmate. I mean, this looks like this looks like Black is starting to have fun, right? But actually, Castle's queen side is the best move for White. Um, and you know, he thought for he did think about it. He thought for eleven minutes, and because he calculated this, he just calculated that maybe before it doesn't actually work. And I calculated too, maybe before it actually doesn't work. Um, and yeah, I spent I spent a while here trying to figure out um, what I actually should do. Um, because if maybe before before doesn't work, Black is already kind of getting into shaky territory. Because, you know, if if we just develop normally, then, you know, white is going to finish up pretty quickly. It's going to be a bishop e2, right? And then centralize the rooks. And, you know, actually play a3, and then, you know, just start h3, g4, gaining some space. And black needs to have some kind of activity going on before that happens. Um, so, yeah, I, this was def this is definitely a critical moment. Um, and I believe... Yeah, I mean, I recognized it was a critical moment, so I spent a long time here. So this was, what, a game in 120, and I spent 8, 18, 26 minutes in this position. Because um, I was trying to figure out, you know, you, you have to find the best move now for, you know, the next couple of years. Otherwise, uh, black is going to be seriously in trouble pretty soon. So, yeah, if you want to try and figure this out, this is not easy. Um, I, I think black has a couple of good continuations, but, yeah, you have to be... Pretty precise about how you do it, and um, you know, then you'll, you'll force white to be a little bit more accurate when he tries to consolidate. So, if you want to pause and try and figure this out, what would you play? So, well, we'll I'll first go through the moves that I consider. So, obviously, you have to consider knight b4, right? Because if this works, then it works. Um, now, it is actually possible for white to take this. So. You know, it's easy to just stop your calculations after this, but you have to consider the move knight g5, because white's actually threatening checkmate. Um, <laughs> sorry. So, you're down a piece. It looks like you're going to pin the queen, but, okay, if you take the bishop, then white plays f4, and you have a mate threat, and your bishop is hanging. So actually, white's just completely winning here. Um, so that means you would have to, and you can't take with a pawn or with a rook either, because you get checkmate with right? So, you'd be game over. Oops. Well, queen takes a 7. That means you'd be forced to take with a queen, and this actually, you know, this end game is, you know, I'd say it's playable. Um, you know, white is probably a little bit better, um, just because black has these long-term structural weaknesses, and white still has. I mean, in the end game, though, yeah, I would say the center is not really that big of an advantage. The deep pawn is more liable to get a weak, and it's going to be strong. Um, you know, we've already traded off two sets of minor pieces. There's not really a lot to be, you know, said for having a nice pawn center anymore. So it's not going to be. There's no pieces for the center to restrict. If we had like two knights on the board also, um, these pawns would be very good for controlling squares the knights might want to go to. But yeah, I mean, with just bishops and rooks on, this should be, you know, white is, white is a small advantage. But yeah, no, so I, the real problem with knight b4 actually though is I did not find a good solution to queen a3. And it, it's important the queen goes here and not to b3, because if the queen goes to b3, then black can consider playing a5. And, you know, I mean, if white plays a3, you know, here already black is having a lot of fun. But I'm not even sure white is threatening to take the knight. It's, that's going to open up the file. This rook is going to you know, get into a1. And, you know, this is the kind of you know, fun that black is looking to have in this position. Um, but yeah, so actually queen a3 would be the only good move here for white. Um, but now this is a big problem because you can't play a5. You can't just take and your pawn is pinned, right? So this is all very concrete. Um, you know, everything is kind of precisely calculated here. And, you know, if you go back to a6, then that's not the reason you played knight b4. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I looked at this, and it is possible to play knight c2. I thought this was a little bit 
bit strange. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, if you're putting your knight in here, it's maybe not so clear after, like, you can see pretty how exactly is this knight supposed to get out. So, you know, I, I look at this for a little bit, but I was not too convinced. Um, I mean, the engine says it is playable, but yeah, you have to be pretty precise with how you follow it up. Like, you have to play some early castles queenside and c5, um, just be able to get some scores for the knight. I, I was a little bit concerned about my knight getting stuck, so I looked for other things that I could do. Um, there are other moves too. So, you know, let's just, there's, there's some tactics that are kind of funny to look at that don't work, but bishop h6, I actually could, did consider, because queen takes h6, maybe now I have plenty of b4, and you can't take because your queen's no main. So this is kind of a funny tactical variation. Um, but white does have a good move here, I just play b3, and then, I mean, yeah, you just sacrificed your bishop, this is just a check, and white's completely winning. So yeah, bishop h6 doesn't work. Um, the best move here, which I did consider, so if you considered this idea, then, yeah, give yourself a lot of credit. The best move is actually bishop g6. Um, which looks like a, if you, you know, at first glance it might seem like this is a strange move, because you're blocking the g file, and what's the bishop doing on g6? Uh, I actually would call this the David Bronstein maneuver, though, because the real point is to play queen f5 and make this super battery this diagonal. Um, and, yeah, if you don't know this David Bronstein thing, um, there's a famous game where he was black and in some similar position against, I don't remember who, but his bishop was on c8, and he played h6, so black had like a normal pawn structure, like this, these pawns here, instead of the pawns that I have. Well, I got pawns on like h7, g7, f7, g6. Um, maybe not on g6, because the bishop could move. He played bishop f5, then he played h6, then he played bishop h7, then he put his queen on g6, and like white, white was totally clueless about that plan. Like, bishop f5, it seemed like just a normal developing move, it wasn't really doing anything. h6 just seemed like it was getting woofed for the back rank. And all of a sudden, when black played bishop h7, there was like already no good defense to queen g6, and then white was like getting checkmated. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously here white is going to do something about that, um, and yeah, I mean, you could consider knight bishop d3, or you can play knight e1 also, so that you can meet queen g6 with bishop d3. Because actually, you know, if you don't do that, you have a hard time stopping this threat. You can't move this bishop so that then you can meet queen g6 or queen f5 with bishop d3, because as soon as you move the bishop from d2, then you get killed with bishop h6. Right? So this is part of the, you know, this, this is what the dynamic activity of the black is looking for, right? So, that's a perfect way that it shows up. Um, so yeah, and actually the reason I rejected this, I like I, I considered knight e1 also, but I wasn't actually so sure. Bishop d3, um, you can take and take on g2, but like I didn't actually really bother to calculate this very much. Um, I just kind of intuitively felt like this was a little bit shaky because you know, this is common, the d file's gonna open up, and if I get stuck in the center here, it's gonna end very quickly. Um, this is actually like, this, this is okay for black. I think black is still like castle queen side here. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, and it should be calculated a little bit more concretely because you are up a pawn up front. This is a pretty important pawn that you take. Um, and now this work can make other threats also. So, yeah, I mean, it's not just like a clear, uh, it's not clearly good that white has enough compensation here. Um, so, yeah, and then after knight e1, though, yeah, now here you have to be still really quick here. And play like e5 probably. And with the idea that if white takes, he shouldn't take. Then we castle. And now like already white is close to lost because rook takes d2 is a massive threat. And bishop h6 is going to come in, and d4 is coming in, and this is like already falling apart for white. Um, so yeah, e5. I mean, white won't be able to take it in any way. Knight d4 is coming in, so again, maybe white plays like a3 to stop that. And now black has the screen side, and we just have an unclear position. Um, so this is what I should have done. I should have played bishop g6. So I'm like, castle them and done that. Um, and my problem was I thought that I had enough time to just castle here. And I thought, okay, well, you still can't develop the bishop because this is hanging on. And I thought, you know, if I castle and you play something like rook g1 to get ready to develop the bishop, then, then I'll play bishop g6. And then we'll basically have all of that except I've already castled, you know, my king is going to be safe. And yeah, the problem is I actually just missed White's next move here. Um, so I castled here, but I think, you know, I, I I could call that the decisive mistake already. Um, and he very quickly played h3. Which, by the way, is the only good move for white. 
Like, if white doesn't play h3, <laughs> I think white is worse. <laughs> because, you know, then, like, all of these ideas are very dangerous. This, this, you know, yeah, maybe four. So, white has to do something very quick. You know, you can't just develop this because, um, or no, actually, maybe bishop e2 is also possible. Um, because, yeah, there is this tactical idea. I did think of maybe one. Um, so, yeah, this was also something to be considered. But h3 is much stronger. He played this very quickly, and I actually, yeah, already started to feel a little bit stupid uh, because the threat is not so much to play g4 because g4 right now, I mean, I could take it, and then you know, you're gonna end up losing your repair. Even that is not so clear. Like there are a lot of lines where white will be perfectly willing to play g4 and just sacrifice that exchange, but because like, black just does nothing here, and plays you know, whatever. Uh, it's hard to like make it up. So the bishop just happened, which is a terrible move. But just to show White's point, like White is perfectly willing to do this, even though it sacrifices this rook in the corner. Because then after bishop d3, I mean, this queen is like almost trapped. She's gonna be you know, like, she's gonna be even if she goes to h3, you know, uh, take any seven, and or you know, uh, even like a move like rook g1. And it, she just has no squares. Like everything is covered here. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, this kind of a position, it it, it 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 gets it, it can get out of hand pretty quickly. I mean, it's it's also hard to just kind of pass and move for black because bishop g7. I mean, white like, just take this. It's not going to do g4 there. Um, and yeah, I mean, like if you play e6, then this bishop is vulnerable to getting trapped. So yeah, I mean, then, like white might consider like rook h2 or something to threaten g4. Um, and the rook will be defended. So, you know, over g1. It's not so easy here, right? Um, the main point is actually it stops bishop g6, because now g4 actually wins the queen. So she has no squares. Um, everything is covered. So, you know, this is a strategic drawback when you're playing this way with black, right? It's very ambitious. So black is signaling that we don't really mind compromising our structure when we're getting in balance and don't mind playing for a win, right? It's some risk, so it might also lose. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if if you don't control the positions very well, the, they get very difficult to handle. Um, so after h3, now I realized here that I'm actually in big trouble. Um, so that's good. Like, you should at least realize that black is in big trouble here. Um, and I thought for a long time here. So let's see, I had, what, 82 minutes after I castled? And I thought until I had 68. So that's, okay, I thought for 14 minutes here. Um, and I played what's pretty much the only move here. I mean, like now you have to go do something active. So I played maybe four. I mean, the alternative is like retreating this bishop, which is just if you do that, then white will just slowly prepare g4, and you're going to be strategically lost pretty, pretty quickly. G1, g4, white is going to fully develop, get space, the king will be safe, and black is absolutely nothing going on here. Um, so, okay, that'd be fun. And now when you play this, you have to have a follow-up after queen a3. Because after queen a3, and after queen a3, if you go back to a6, then you know, this was not the point, right? So, I mean, you know, we can't go to d3, we can't, we can't, we can't go to c2, I mean, you could play knight c2, right? And then, okay, you don't have to have a follow-up to, like, to, to this. Or, you know, I guess even queen takes a7 could be considered. Right? I mean, this gets very messy. Because that also defends the d4 pawn. And, yeah, I mean... That, that's just not going to be good for black, but if you do queen a7, that's, that's just good for white. Um, so, yeah, if you want to see, or if you want to try and figure out, or if you want to try, try and guess what I had in mind here. So I had this in mind when I played it before. Um, I'm not sure if he saw this idea, because he looked pretty shocked when I played it. Um, but, yeah, I would call this an imaginative idea. You have to kind of be imaginative if you want to play this kind of position for black. Um, and... Really, any move has to be considered here. You can't just throw anything out just, you know, on the basis of how absurd it looks. Your main point is you absolutely have to make a threat. So, whatever you play, you have to threaten something. Um, even if you're like, you know, sacrificing material, you have to make a threat. So, and you can sacrifice big here. <laughs> so all the pieces are still on the board. You can sacrifice a lot of material and still have a lot left to play around with. Um, so the point is you have to start making threats and get some activity. So, all right. 
yeah, if you if you found it, uh, I mean, that, this move it objectively just doesn't work. Like Black should just play knight a6 and accept basically a strategically lost position. Um, and then yeah, I mean, White will play rook g1. Same thing as before. Get the bishop out. You know, play g4 at the right moment, and Black is going to be. Um, this knight is just terrible, and this position is obviously going to fall apart for Black very quickly. Um, these pieces will have to retreat, right? And this is going to be good for White. So the move I had in mind was rook takes your ship. So obviously we're not going to retreat the knight. Um, and I kind of smiled when I played this over the because I, I knew it didn't really work, um, but I had already kind of realized that I had no other choice really. Because knight a6, you're just going to accept a strategically lost position, which against a GM, you're not going to hold. Um, you know, Joshua Ruiz, he was an excellent form this tournament too. Like he, he crushed the number two seed later in this event. It was over 2,600. He beat him in like, Less than 20 moves, um, which was I mean, incredible. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you, you can't just play passively like this. You have to do something else. So, it takes you to. Now, I mean, what's going on here, right? So, it's, it's, yeah, I kind of was smiling to myself, you know, beneath my mask because this is just such a ridiculous looking move. Like, the knight is hanging twice, it's not defended at all. So, instead of doing something about that, what do we do? We, we sacrifice a rook, right? So, What's going on here? Uh, <laughs> well, okay, I mean, white can't actually take the rook because then we get an 3 check in, right? And then we start having some fun. So, you know, I mean, you're, you're going to have to walk into some discovered check, and then, you know, I, I didn't really calculate this any further. There's all sorts of shenanigans. You can play this, and then drop the bishop, and you'll have compensation for the exchange there. I mean, you can play this with some double check. And, you know, if white wants to avoid a perpetual, he'll still like, walk off the board here with his king. You can play this. C5 check, and I mean, yeah, you're having a lot of fun here on all variations. Um, yeah, like, like C5 check, if White wants to avoid a perpetual, he has to come up here, right? And, you know, you stop analyzing once you see the king on C3. I mean, you are down a rook, but I, I mean, this is, yeah, if it wants to keep playing for a win, he has to start, you know, <laughs> doing some risky stuff. Um, okay, anyway. Um, yeah, probably just knight e1 and knight takes you 2 is like the simplest way to go for them black. Um, and then you're just gonna play for the long term. Light spurs there. This king will never be safe. So I'm sure he didn't really even consider bishop takes before, or bishop takes you do. And he quickly played. I mean, he thought for like six minutes. Um, so I mean, the only move here that is even reasonable to play is bishop takes b4. Um, if you play queen takes b4, then I can take on f3. And you can't even take my rook because after this, you literally have no way of stopping checkmate. Um, I, I mean, you can try. You have literally like, no defense. Um, I'm going to C2 and Queen B1 mate, and there's just absolutely nothing you can do about it. So, should take some point. Right, so, I mean, the idea is it's a, it's a peace sacrifice. We're just going to sacrifice the knight, but now I get to take on it too, and it's also a little bit scary, right? So, I have C2 check coming in, this bishop can be coming in, right? The E5 at some moment to open up his other rook, right? It looks like black is kind of getting all the pieces into the attack, but the problem is it doesn't really work. Um, and I knew it didn't work going into it, but I didn't see better alternatives. So, you know, rather than have a strategically lost position, let's get something that's at least a little bit unclear and messy. So he quickly plays the only move, 92, um, which, you know, it's forced. I'm threatening this, and I'm also attacking the knight. And 81 is going to be pretty awkward, the bishop h6 check. Um, and, you know, we get something really fun. If you block with the bishop, I can even sack the queen. Uh, you're gonna, yeah, you're not gonna have a lot of fun here with white. Um, so, I can play, I can play lots of discover checks. And this might actually just be quickly leading to checkmate, um, because these two bishops are just total monsters. They take away all the squares, and after queen e3, you can get checkmate. So, yeah, I mean, you can do that. Um, so, I can get this knight to two. Yeah, and here I thought for a long time too. So, I saw we would get to this position. I hadn't quite seen what I could do from here. But, you know, I figured maybe there's some way for Black to make this semi play here. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, there's, there's just no way to do it. Um, you do have two pawns for a piece, and you could take a third. But the problem is, White has this very dangerous counterplay. He takes a7, when well, actually your king is going to be in big trouble. Um, so this queen and bishop can combine to create some very serious threats, or at least to just start, you know, mopping up all the queens and pawns. So queen takes a7, queen a8, queen takes b7. And, yeah, after that, that's six falls, and you get the idea. So yeah, I thought for a long time here. Um, I thought for, uh, what, like, 
almost half an hour, 29 minutes, yeah. Because, um, I mean, yeah, it's a critical moment. You kind of have to, if, if you don't find anything with black here, then it's just lost, right? And I would say, like, if you're ever curious or if you are ever, like, playing against someone who's thinking for a long time, usually when somebody thinks for more than 20 minutes, like, let's say, you know, at, at this level, right, like, me and my opponent were, you know, 2400, 2500 level. Um, when someone at that level thinks for more than 20 minutes, it's usually not a good sign. It's a sign that they don't like their position. Um, they just don't see anything good. Because 20 minutes at, you know, at, at our level here, we can calculate, you know, like, we can calculate stuff within 20 minutes. If, if there is something that's been here for a while, we would fund it within 20 minutes. Um, and the fact that we're thinking for a long time here means that we're not seeing anything, right? Like, so I considered a lot of stuff in the top. You know, bishop g6 sets this up, right? Obviously, rook takes d4 has to be considered. Bishop h6, right? Um, you know, the, the big problem, though, is queen takes a7 is pretty much going to be coming in, like, whenever, right? Um, and you don't have time for a slow move like a6. This is really important because white has this very nasty move, queen g3. Um, and I, this is something that I had missed from, like, far away. Like, from far away, I thought, okay, I, I thought... I, we would get to this position, and I saw he's kind of pinned down. At the very least, maybe I can just play a slow move like a6. Or get my bishops out. If black has time for this, and then play bishop h6 and take here, then it's very unclear. Like, white may not be better here. But because of this queen g3 move, this just wins on the spot. Because my rook is trapped. I mean, I have to spend as much square as you Everything is covered, and I mean, I just sacrifice it, and then I'll be on the run. So, that did not seem like. An appealing option. Um, the problem is if I don't play a6, then you won't take on this out. I can't play king b8 for the same reason. That's even worse. That's a whole rook. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I considered a lot of stuff just to show you the range of stuff I, I looked at. Um, I think the first move I looked at was like rook takes d4, but that's pretty quickly, you can throw that out for a number of reasons. I think it, you can take on a7, that's just the simplest, and even queen g3 or queen e3 is not so clear. But yeah, like just this. And your rooks are actually pinned to each other, so... Um, yeah, I mean, if you take here, then I think white is just going to be happy to take it. And, I mean, these pins don't even work. At this point, you can't even move this bishop, because you you might just get checkmated after, like, queen eight. If you can't run the king this way, well, I mean, obviously the rook is here. But, yeah, like, I mean, bishop a5, and white's going to give me here the next white piece. Um, or at the very least, like I could have just taken the rook here. So none of this stuff really works. Yeah, just take your rook. That's simple. So yeah, rook takes e4 is out. Um, I consider, you know, bishop h6 also. This is also out because white takes on a7. And he's actually threatening, um, he's threatening checkmate uh, or to win this rook. So like, you know, you don't have, you don't have time to do stuff here. Like, you know, maybe bishop g6 you would consider, right? Try and line up over here, but not queen eight. You, you don't have a good answer to this. King d7 is going to talk to this because your bishop has left f8. You can't hide here anymore because that's going to be checkmate. And yeah, I mean, I didn't really consider this much further. I just stopped calculating once my king gets to f5. At the very least, we can take this rook and yeah, that's completely winning. Um, so yeah, bishop h6 doesn't work. And yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot else to consider. I considered a5, so just to give you some sense of how desperate I was here. I, I mean, if you have to take with a bishop, I think, yes, maybe. I mean, if you can take bishop h6, I kind of pretend that this might work, because there's no queen here anymore. But obviously, after a5, he's going to take the queen, and this doesn't help you at all. Um, yeah, I mean, c5 here, I think I also considered that. Um, and. I believe he just, uh, I believe here he could just tape or something. Yeah, like this wasn't really working. Um, so, yeah, in the end, I, I didn't see anything better than bishop g6. Um, and there is really nothing here for black, so uh, bishop g6 is probably as good a practical try as anything. Um, because now at least I make a threat, like a threatening queen f5. Um, I think you can still get away with taking on a7. Uh, maybe. Sure, but it, it's much simpler to just play bishop d3, which is what he did. Because um, this isn't really going anywhere. 
the more pieces that get traded off, you know, we get rid of this dangerous bishop, then nothing's going to have no attack. So I played rook takes d4. Yeah, here I also thought for a long time, like I used almost all of my remaining time here. I thought for another 29 minutes. So for the last two moves, I used like pretty much an hour from my clock. Um, I mean, yeah, if, if you're faced with a decision between finding your next move or just resigning, you know, you, you can take as much time as you need if you're looking for any resources you have. And there's really no way to save this position. So like c5, I considered, I mean, this doesn't work for other reasons. Like even this, and this end game is, it's not really very good. Um, not a trade. I mean, white is going to have an extra piece and you, you may have some funny business going on, some cuts, but like this is not really a big deal. I can also just play like queen g3. Now, the queen is hanging and the rook is hanging. So that would be bad. Um, yeah, I mean, a5 is, is also not very good. Like, here, here, this is even worse actually, because queen a8 check. And you can lose the queen. So, yeah, I mean, there's really nothing to do here. Bishop h6, queen takes f7. And once again, we have the same queen a8, queen b7, queen b7 problem. So, it's tough. I ended up playing rook takes d4. I thought was the best practical chance. And he takes. Rook takes six. Rook takes a seven. Um, so okay, I'm just sort of getting skewered here. Play queen d3. So I do have some, you know, some threat. I'm actually threatening rook takes c4 check because the knight would not be able to take. Um, the bishop blocks. I'll just sacrifice it and have, you know, probably at least a perpetual. Um, but okay, obviously he's not going to walk into that. Plays bishop c3. And I have one more, like, you know, last desperate trick that I can try. Um, I played rook takes d2. So, yeah, I mean, if I play rook takes d4, then, you know, he can't take it, obviously, because this is checkmate. But, I, I mean, you can just take my rook. And this is going nowhere. There's, there's no perpetual here. The king is gonna, is gonna walk out. And here, your only check is here, and then the knight blocks. We have one more check, and, you know, the king is gonna walk away eventually here. One more check here. Um, there's no more checks. You're down two rooks here, which is quite a lot. Um, so, yeah, rook takes d2 is really the only try left, but I mean, this is a yeah, also kind of a funny position. Um, I mean, you're threatening checkmate, and I mean, obviously, he's going to take the rook. Bishop h6. And if white actually tries, tries to be like materialistic and hold on to this rook, uh, then this would be pretty funny. Like, Rook, rook H2 would be a big mistake. I'm sure you would have considered this for very long. Because, yeah, after Rook takes C4, you, you, you can stop the sacrifices here. But then Black can just, like, play some move like B5 and then B4. And even though White's up a Rook and it says turn, like, all of his pieces are pinned and stuck. I mean, this Rook can't move on D2. This Bishop can't move. The King can't move. This Rook can't move because it has to defend this. I mean, this Rook goes. I can just take. Um, even here, I can just take this. Special respect. I mean, even this would be stronger. Um, King can throw here, and White is going to get checkmated pretty soon. So, yeah, this would be a funny position. Um, and obviously, he didn't go for it because we did some fun. And now I'm down two rooks. I can win both of them back for one bishop. So I can take on to do. I have this trick. You can't take with a bishop because you have to defend your queen. So this is forced. Then I can play queen f3 check. And then I can. I threw this check in first. It doesn't really matter. And I take on each one. But yeah, even though I, it looks like there might be some chances here for black to have two pawns for the bishop, you know, maybe this king is a little bit exposed, and you know, maybe this pawn is weak, you know, this bishop, maybe we can block it with these pawns somehow. But yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty clear, pretty quickly here that this is just over. Um, so queen g4, king b8, he plays king c2, and okay, I tried like for one more move, queen f1, queen g8, and here I raised the white flag, and resign. So, yeah, I mean, I would say really my mistake is probably going into this position and just deciding that I could play this by feel. So, you know, just like not having any concrete knowledge on what position. Like, I know the general idea is that you want to use your active pieces and, you know, and you're playing for, for peace activity and, you know, quickly play e5 and combine these, like, maybe four ideas, this work, you know, broken bishops on these diagonals and somehow make things work before White consolidates. But yeah, I think really if you're going to play this against a good player, like Joshua Ruiz is a good player, um, you have to 
back this up with some pretty serious computer analysis. Um, because, I mean, yeah, he's going to find moves like queen e3, and he's going to find, after bishop f5, castles, castles, he's going to find moves like h3. Um, which, I mean, they may not be obvious to everybody, but to a GM, they're going to be pretty obvious. Um, so, and yeah, I mean, if you don't have the right, you know, if you don't know concretely what moves you have to play, like rook g8 might already not be the most accurate. Um, after, you know, after having analyzed this now, I think if black is going to try and make this work, he should play bishop g4. It, with the point that we're basically gonna, we're not gonna spend a move on getting this rook in. Every, every tempo matters here. And if my plays bishop e2, to stop us from, uh, you know, doubling your pawns here, the black just castles. And basically says, I'm gonna play e5, Oops, e5, and just blow everything open. And here already, like, white has to be accurate to keep the advantage. White is still better, but he has to play accurate. Like, for example, bishop d2 is a very natural move, but now already after b5, it's very unclear. Like, if you castle queenside, then, you know, this stuff starts to happen, which is five, and black is getting way too much activity very quickly. Um, so, and, you know, if you don't play bishop 2, let's say you castle, this is even worse, because now you're g8, the king is just not safe here. Right? So, you know, if you don't play bishop 2 and you don't castle, then it's not clear, like, what exactly you're supposed to do. Right? You can't leave the king in the center, because e5 is happening anyway, right? So, yeah, I won't reveal like, all of my analysis here, but just to show you that, you know, this kind of position, you have to be really fast for black. Because one small inaccuracy can like land you in the trouble that um, I gave got myself into. Um, natural moves are just not quite good enough to so, like really you know, redo it. So yeah, that's pretty much happening. Rook g8, bishop d2, bishop f5, castles. And here this is still playable. You find bishop g6, um, and then you know, the idea is just quickly go e5 and pull a castle. But yeah, I overlooked this h3 move. After which yeah, now pretty much I would say black is effectively lost now. You know, it's not like, it's not maybe resignable lost, but like after queen a3, if your best move is to go back to a6, then this is clearly not what you want to get out of this opening. Yeah. So, okay, well, yeah, that was you know, only one of two games that I lost this event, so this one I would say was <laughs> probably an opening disaster. Um, the other game that I lost was not an opening disaster, so we'll get to that one later. Um, but yeah, for now, uh, yeah, after this, I had one out of two, so we'll see in the next round uh, what happens in round three.